So, internet security is all very well, but how's that going to save the planet from global warming? In this presentation, at the end, I'm going to be showing you exactly how we can help. Hello, I'm Philip Ann Baker, and this is continuing on from the last presentation on the mesh service protocols. And in this one, I want to describe the protocols that we haven't described yet. And so this is all stuff that isn't yet designed, but as I think you're going to see as we go along, building this stuff is really quite easy. It is really straightforward. It's just a matter of deciding what exactly we want to do. So recall that we Alice has her Mesh account and she has a bunch of devices connected to this account. And the account has a relationship with some service in the cloud. And this means that we establish a bi-directional trust context. So service can know that this device belongs to Alice. Device can know that this is the service Alice picked. So we've got a strong two-way binding. And as far as possible, we want to make the cloud service as uh, 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 as untrusted as possible. However, it is a service that Alice picked and we've got a security binding with it. And so with all those, so we've got a bunch of things that today the device just takes from untrusted services. Why not take them from the cloud and get something that's a bit more trustworthy? So what, what, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, one example would be time. Today, internet devices tend to pick up network time protocol from, well, a lot of them just take it at pretty much at random from something that the app author or the platform provider just picked. And that's really bad when what we're looking for is to use that time service to provide a cutoff on some PKI revocation technique or whatever. You know, time, knowing the current time, can be a very effective security control because it means that we can have uh, statements of the form, here are all the certificates that were revoked in the past two hours. And anything beyond two hours, well, those have expired. And so knowing time is really useful. It allows us to bound, bound uh, a lot of checks about against double spending and that type of thing. So I'd like to be able to get trusted time, or at least something better than, you know, wherever we got it from time, and get it into the device. And so the service connects up to, you know, the NIST, the... UK Greenwich Meridian uh, Laboratory and so on, connects to a bunch of these uh, time clocks around the world, synchronizes with them and provides a trustworthy form of time for that device. And then this device can know that it is in sync with the rest of the internet as far as trust decisions are concerned. This is not necessarily going to be something that is used to reset the clock in the device itself but it is something that can then be used for decisions that require a trusted source of time. And of course, we'll do this in UTC or TAI or something better uh, so that um, we don't have to worry about all the local conversion factors uh, coming in and mucking stuff up. So time service is one thing that we can put in. What else could we put in there? Well, another one is DNS. Now recall that in the last slide I showed you that we have this triple lock secure pipe that's connecting the device to the service in the cloud. So all the communications backwards and forwards between the service and the device are being encrypted. This sounds like a really good uh, basis for sticking in our deprive type or DOE type DNS uh, encrypted, encrypted DNS resolution. 
And so we perform, we, essentially what we want to do to get secure DNS is to replace the client to resolve a protocol and leave the rest of the DNS, the resolver to authoritative uh, service uh, part of DNS, leave that all in place. So that does regular DNS. And then the device can just use this as a pipe to pick a DNS resolver that Alice has picked rather than the DNS server that her local network happens to have picked and may have been um, overridden because of some authoritarian government or whatever. Now, obviously, there are a few caveats that we have to put out there because obviously overriding the DNS has become a thing for many other thing, reasons. And in an a enterprise environment, we often override the DNS to provide a form of device protection and firewalling type uh, capabilities. And so in the context of a network, you know, a, an enterprise network, we've got to think about that as well. And it may be that Alice has to decide if she wants to use her corporate network, then she's got to accept that for, per, for corporate purposes, when it's on the corporate network, it has to go to the corporate resolver. So, okay, so we can put out a mechanism like that and run it over the mesh service protocol. Can we go further? Well, what are we looking for when we're doing DNS? We're really wanting to establish a connection between a client and a server. Yeah. Clients are the only things that make use the DNS for discovery. Okay, If you're doing discovery of a, a service, by definition, you must be the client. And so what you're wanting to do is you have a question of the form, you know, I want to do some protocol. So let's call that uh, IMAP. I want to do it with some DNS host. And really what you want to be able to do is throw this query at the DNS. Give me the way to connect using the IMAP protocol to example.com and you tell me everything I know to make that connection. And all that information should be there in the DNS in the form of either SRV records or TXT records. You know, we should use DNS service discovery for everything. Okay, I know that we're not quite there yet with the uh, IETF space and that's not quite how we use the DNS, but that's how we should. It is how we should. And so what I would like to be able to do is to throw a query of the form. I am Alice. Well, that's implicit in any query that comes from one of Alice's devices. Tell me how to get to I'm the, the IMAP service from example.com. And down comes from the resolver a complete answer saying, here is the IPv6 address. Here is the uh, protocol version to use. Here is the TLS cert that the host in question uses. Here is the OCSP token for that certificate. Here is the security policy that binds that interaction. And so this is kind of like super DNS, doing it all in the cloud and the device just gets the answer back. And this was a protocol I just proposed quite a while ago under the name Omnibroker. And it basically has two modes. In mode A, what happens is that the client, imagine it's a laptop or whatever, it asks the resolver, you go out and you collect all this information together and you bring it back to me and then I will check your work, which is you know sensible for a laptop or whatever. And then for a constrained device where you don't want to put a DNS sec stack on, you don't want to put a complicated DNS stack on or PKX, uh, PKX uh, OCSP validation and all that stuff, we can push all the path math 
onto the resolver. And so all that this uh, device then needs to do is to, you know, it relies on the mesh service completely to outsource all its trust decisions, which isn't the sort of thing that many of you are going to be comfortable for on a laptop, which can do the math, but you know, for a coffee pot or whatever, it's a better approach because that means that we can put all the trust processing decisions in one place where they can be accessed from any device in our network and we have one place in our network where we can figure our trust decisions. Okay, so what else might this cloud service be doing for Alice? Well, it could be providing presence. I mean, presence is a feature that you really want for protocols like Jabber. And of course, you know, if somebody's going to send Alice a Jabber message, well, why can't the mesh service, if it's going to be doing the NTP and DNS, then each one of her devices is going to be constantly connecting up and saying, hey, I'm here. And so this makes a natural point of presence for her Jabber and her other uh, connection capabilities. And so this, uh, this service can provide presence protocol as well. Now, obviously, if somebody wants to do Jabber, then this service is going to have to open up an XMPP port as well you know but we could have a mesh presence service and then provide all those end-to-end -end secure capabilities and all those traffic analysis defeating capabilities that we added into mesh services and so we can do that as well and once we've got that capability you know, once you've got the capability of calling somebody and getting this service to say, okay, here, Alice, um, you want to talk to, you know, Alice, Bob wants to talk to Alice. And Alice's mesh service gets a request from Bob. And it checks. Is, uh, is Bob in the contacts list? Yes. Is Bob one of the people who's allowed to do synchronous messaging? Yes. Okay. Let's put the call through to Alice. Alice says, yes, I want to pick up. And at this point, we can have a handoff and we can provide the actual um, IP address and the port on which to connect to Alice uh, from the outside and you know, do all those good things. And so from this point, we've got a presence protocol that does the connection establishment and that hands off to you know, voice, video, messaging. Yeah. We've got those protocols already. We could just use the mesh as a way of providing the secure, the end-to-end -end secure presence capability. And of course, this is something that if we're going to go that way, we would have to deeply integrate with WebRTC and all that work and, you know, think in advance for how we deal with multiple cameras and all that stuff and so on and so forth. 